today we have our 21st ecological dialogue without isolation and our guest is our dear colleague john chapman who was working in former yugoslavia in several places since the early 80s maybe late late 70s on sites uh, famous sites like vincha about which we will talk together more then he moved to Dalmatia, to Zadar area, to Ravnikotari, with his project Neothermal Dalmatia. And then you were present on several occasions on some shorter visits. You probably won't remember that one year you, you were a grass professor in Ljubljana as well. I remember very well. Yes. <laughs> right. Today we have asked you, since it's 40 years uh, after your first major monograph on Vincha, and I know that you have uh, written a sort of a 40 years later reflection on your work and on your monograph, which is about to be published very, very soon. And uh, at that occasion, we have decided to invite you and to have a dialogue with you. So let's start. Let's have a few minutes of informing us how you started to work in Vincha in the late 70s, early 80s, what was uh, the situation uh, at that time and uh, how you managed to write, write down actually what is the first synthesis on Vincha. Uh, there were not many synthetic works. At that time, I, I believe you worked in the museum in Carlisle in, in, in England when you decided to move to work on Vincha. Well, part of the, the introductory comments are in the PowerPoint. So, um, but yeah, I was uh, I, I was working on my thesis in in London on on Vincha with John Andrews and my Belgrade wife um, Maya Martinovic. Yes, um, Belgradsky Zet She was expecting our first child, and uh, exactly at this moment, I, I ran out of scholarship money. Good timing, Chapman. And she had to give up her job in the Museum of London. So I had to find another job to support the family. And the only there were no academic jobs. And the only job I could find was in Carlisle Museum in the frozen northwest. So we moved there. And my daughter, Eleanor, was born in Carlisle. So she's an ethnic Cumbrian. So when they declare UDI, she'll get a passport, but we won't. And so I finished my thesis during the first three months of the job in Carlisle, just just before Eleanor was born, in fact. And then I submitted the thesis and London examined it later in 1976. Um, and they had the examiners were John Nandris and Colin Renfrew before he became Lord Renfrew. And because Renfrew was too busy, we mm -hmm. had to travel to Southampton to, for the PhD Viva. Um, but I didn't do much more until I got a job in, in Newcastle in January 1980. And only then did I have time to write up the, the book that became the Vincha BAR. So that's, that's how it started. But I say some of this in the, in the PowerPoint, but I'll, I'll miss out most of that. Mm -hmm. But you wrote your book based on your visits to Vincha site, Yugoslavia, to Belgrade, or most of the work was done through analyzing bibliography, which wasn't really very rich at the time. Oh, no, not at all. No, I, I went around every, virtually every museum in the country. And there was only one place that wouldn't allow me to look at Vincha material. I saw a huge amount of Vincha material. And the only place that wouldn't let me see it was, was Pristina. Uh, where Jovan Glisic was the custos of archaeologia at the time. And he, um, after three days of waiting in the museum, he invited me to come to his flat on the third evening. And when I got there, his wife answered the door and she said, I have a message from my husband. He says, even if you were drug Tito, you cannot see my Vinci material. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> well, very decisive. <laughs> yeah. So that was it. But the other thing I did was to visit, um, probably quite illegally, and certainly without the knowledge of my Belgrade supervisor, Milutin Garashinin, 
I was able to visit about 80 different venture sites, so certainly some of the most important ones. And I wrote, wrote down notes uh, for you know, that good old processualist technique, site catchment analysis. So I worked out huge quantities of site information as well. And with the help of Dragana Antonovich's father, who was a great professor of pedology in Belgrade at the time, uh, he gave me access to very detailed soils maps for many of these venture sites. So I had a huge amount of Terenska Informatia, uh, not just libraries, um, though I did. I spent a lot of I had a, a whole year in Belgrade at the University of Belgrade. And in the winter months, I spent a lot of time looking at the early reports from venture sites from Yablanica. Mejuruja onwards, that was the first. So from the 1890s, I went through the, the various Godishniti and all the other publications of the, the Subska Academia Nauka at the time. I certainly learned a huge amount from those library visits. And that's why I was able to complete uh, what was at the time an up-to-date list of over 600 venture sites, because I'd actually read all the literature. I mean, I didn't know it off by heart. Unlike Professor Garashin, we had um, weekly meetings in his flat. He was, um, I wasn't registered with him because he was not a professor of prehistory. Um, and so, and he was politically unstable. So he didn't dare go meet me in the university. But we met in his flat over a glass of Tonogoska uh, Loza. And Milutin had this fantastic memory. I mean, you could mention any, the name of any venture site, and he would tell you all the details that you needed to know about it. He knew every single site. Absolutely extraordinary. You know, and he, he could have written a thesis about venture um, from the top of his head, probably. What directed you to, to venture in the first place? Well, well after the famous John Nandro's um, um, Macedonian survey, where we were all arrested and thrown in jail, and Nandros was fined, and we had to abandon the project, that was the year of the 1971 UISPP in Belgrade. And I went there, and I was too poor to get um, to um, become a member of an official member of the conference. So. I borrowed a friend's card for half days when she went off shopping and I went to the meeting, but I, I was absolutely broke. And John Nandris uh, drove me one day in the Institute of Archaeology London and Land Rover to the Vincent Hotel. And at that point, I fell in love with the site and thought I have to do more about it. And because John Nandris's own PhD thesis was about the early Neolithic, I thought it would be sensible to work on something different. So, in other words, the next major group in the Central Balkans, and that was Vincia. But having seen the tell itself, um, I, I was just uh, uh, like the picture in the PowerPoint. I was just absolutely amazed and fell in love with the place. Later on, it transpired that Maya had been brought up in Vincia village because her father, Petar Martinovic, the biologist, was the director of the Vincia uh, Biological Laboratory on the, the top of the Vincia Tell, and she lived on the Vincia Tell, mm -hmm. and later married someone who wrote a thesis about the Vincia Tell. So it all it all connects up, you understand. Yeah. Well, right. Uh, we'll now let you present your work and your thoughts about Wincha. I will turn off my camera and microphone and please John the podium is yours. Well this is just the structure of the talk. Uh, I've already given you some introduction the amuse-bouche but we'll go on to Prediela which is um, what the thesis doesn't cover anymore. Then the main part mission or meso what's still useful and then why no synthesis and then which is the best bit right so this is the introduction then and when i mentioned in when i was at school still i suggested i'd like to study archaeology 
psychology and my teachers thought this was a totally crazy idea which made me want to study it even more and so I formed part of the second undergraduate cohort at the London Institute of Archaeology and when I got to know John Nandris on on slide here um, I joined him on his Yugoslav Macedonian field survey where we all ended up in prison um, and that made me want to study um, Balkan archaeology even more and I mentioned then how I visited the Vinci Hotel while at the UISPP conference in Belgrade in 1971 and that set me to writing an undergraduate dissertation on the origins of the Vinci culture. This led further to writing a PhD with John Nandrish, and in that four-year period, I spent a year in Belgrade with the Garashnins, here they are, Milutin and Lalka, a year of Tsernogorska Loza, with lots of museum coffee and lots of site visits. And eventually this led to the PhD thesis called The Blue Whale by Greg Johnson, um, because it was so large and useful only for pressing photographs. And it was full of solid empirical data, but it wasn't an analysis. And it took me some time when I gained a university job in Newcastle um, to do the analysis of the data in the blue whale and turn it into a publication. And on the left is the blue whale, and on the right is the publication that um, we're going to be discussing today. These are some of the basic um, new points in the thesis in the book. There's the list of 639 Vinci sites, which I turned into a, a site-based sequence in 36 different regions over here. There are the sites, there are the regions, and there's a lot of other data which I gathered, especially this list of 22 types of special finds, prestige goods, ritual finds, and fine ceramics, all very good processual stuff with their distributions. And the interpretations I suggested was that it was time to move away from a, a view of the Vincha group which was centered on the Vincha Tell. And I suggested there was this tension between a ritualized social order and a ranked society. And I did lots of correlations with these prestige ritual and fine pots and other things. I suggested also that aspects of the secondary products revolution, plough agriculture, was there to produce a ritual surplus, Chernozem, Smolitzers and brown forest soils. And I suggested also the social significance of, of advances in metallurgy, stone carving, fine wares, and monumental figures. The context to the book, though, was, as I said, 1981. Although this was the, the year of the Symbolic and Structural Archaeology Conference in Cambridge, which was the beginning of the post-processual movement, um, 1981 was still very much a high peak of processualist writing. Uh, in other words, no gender at all. Sorry, Stasha. With site catchment analysis still in its heyday, very few radiocarbon dates, very little open area excavation, except for Vasich at Vincha, dry sipping and flotation rare, contextual recording almost unknown. And it was still illegal in Serbia to conduct field survey. And the key point then was that Vincha Belobodo was seen as the key to the whole Vincha group. So that was the context. Um, uh, against which I was writing. Now let's look. Zhivili, Zdravo. What can we discard from the Fincher thesis 40 years on? Well, these are six things in which archaeology has moved on so much. In the, in the book, there are certainly weaknesses. Not my fault. It just happens that science moves on. When it comes to objects, we can think about color and brilliance. As I said in my general prediella, I looked at thousands, tens of thousands of Vincha shirts, and there were only two general properties of Vincha pottery that I ignored in this book. One, that they were dark, in other words, their color, 
and the other that they were burnished. Otherwise, otherwise they're brilliant. Um, that was a severe mistake. But those old black and white days, like in the picture on the left, lasted into the new millennium, and colour gave us new ways of seeing the past, like the picture on the right. When it comes to house assemblages, the book was very much a, presented a reflectionist view of house assemblages. What you got was what you saw, and that's what you could tell. But very much in this debate I've had with Marco Porcic, and that's a Porcic picture. My, the biggest weakness in the book, there was no mention of deliberate house burning, despite Ruth Tringham's work on this. Instead, I was looking for activity areas based on furniture, fittings and objects, very much like Boban Trivkovic, that's his picture from his book, did at Banyitsa recently. And I suggested that household ritual showed ritual penetration into the deepest levels of the social fabric. These are probably um, not such strong arguments anymore. The biggest change in those 40 years has come in terms of context. I'm sorry that these PowerPoint slides are missing their headings, but I'll, so I'll improvise the headings. So there were three aspects of context. Obviously, the temporal context. Here's some a Bayesian model from Vincha. The spatial context from geophysics. Here's a plot from Stubliner. And the cultural context from, from single context recording. There was hardly any contextual detail available in 1981. When it came to um, subsistence patterns, I had two main proposals in the book. The first one that there was varying regional arable potential, and that became the basis for certain settlement concentrations uh, in the early Vincha phase. So on the left, then we have we're looking down into a rather um, murky Morava Valley with lowland settlement concentrations. On the right, we're looking up the at the dissected hill country southwest of Shabats. So in the low uh, foothills of the Ter Planine, where there was no such high arable potential and no settlement concentrations. The other suggestion was there was an early development of the secondary products revolution in Vincha with art agriculture, dairying and woolly sheep. I think now um, I'd make rather more nuanced proposals about each of these ideas. But it's still true, I think, that there was no such thing as a unified, homogenous Neolithic economy. I still think that actually works. In terms of exchange, I had a pretty simple view of exchange, that there was short distance exchange up to 50 kilometers and long distance exchange. Uh, beyond 50 kilometers, just like the two kinds of transhumans I suggested. And of course, many people have come up with much better schemes. Um, let's go on one slide to see Evgen Neustupny's idea. This is Evgen Neustupny's um, version of um, spatial arrangements with familiar, other, foreign, 20 to 70 kilometers away, remote, and these I've suggested remote and continental are even further away. Let's go back, though, to look for a moment at Koti Kovac's 2013 exchange routes in the Carpathian Basin, her internal, uh, her external and her internal routes. Obviously, much more information, much better conceptualized than two kinds of exchange. And in the book, then, I suggested the importance of directional trade in obsidian and spondylus to Vinci Belo Burdo and the Vrshat sites for the for ranking and the creation of local central places. Um, uh, and I think that's probably also due for reanalysis. And again, Boban Trubkovic has done um, much more interesting stuff with spondylus, showing much more spondylus exchange in Vincha D that I hadn't picked up earlier. On chronostratigraphies, I think this was one of the mistakes that I held on to longest, but I think eventually I have to give up on this, and that was this idea that 
there was an asymmetry between the early venture phase, phases A to C, and the late venture phase, a long phase D. And Dushan Boric argued against this, and Tottle has argued against this. That's the green arrow. My scheme is here. That's essentially the, the Tottle scheme based on Milosevic. Uh, and I can't sustain that anymore. But the total dates show that Vincia C is much longer than I proposed, and I accept that. And Nina Tasic's excavations show that the latest Vincia D on the Tell was much later than the latest Vincia D found on the Tell by Vasic. And this suggests, but it doesn't prove, that the full sequence of Vincia group was material was represented at the Vincia Belloboda Tell. doesn't prove it because there aren't enough AMS dates from Vincia D sites in the rest of the area. Okay, so much for what hasn't survived. Has anything at all survived from the um, Vincia book? I think there are five areas where something useful survives. Vincia origins, regional variability, networks, subsistence and size, and regional settlement narratives. I'll be brief. On Vincia origins, in the book, I suggested a center periphery hypothesis from North Shumadia to three other areas, essentially the Vincia area. In the Total Potscapes article, they suggest a rapid establishment of Vincia A with early dates in the north, not the south. The way that Vincia began in the book, I suggested a selection from a wide range of different fineware decorative styles and motifs. So it was, in a sense, a competition of selection from different fine wares. And here are some of them. In the Potscapes article, Alistair Whittle talks about a time of considerable cultural and material fluidity, not only hybridization. Plus ça change? In terms of regional variability, the Total Potscapes paper shows very long overlaps between each pair of Vincia phases in the whole group. You can see these overlaps here, Vincia A, Vincia B1, 2, Vincia B1 and 2, virtually, Vincia B and C, C and D, long overlaps. What does this mean? It means that there are different ceramic assemblages at the same time in adjacent Vincia regions, just as I suggested in chapter three of the book, although I did it in a, a very simple way. By the percentage similarity, this is percentage similarity compared to Vincia pottery at Banitsa, Jarkovo, Drenovac, Gornetuzla, and Tartaria. So no change there really in interpretation. In terms of networks in the book, I suggested this rather schematic exchange connectivity by phase. This is Venture B in these terms now. And also for artifact diffusion, this is Venture B. Yeah. And in the book, I suggested the maximum connectivity was in EV2, Venture B. In the Total Potscapes paper, the peak of connectivity is, would you believe, Venture B2. Sounds familiar? And on settlement size and site size, in the book, I suggested that territorial resources within a five kilometer radius would be sufficient for site sizes of up to 30 hectares. And one of the best modeling exercises, not for Vincia, but for Tripilje, by Shukurov, Anwar Shukurov and Al, shows that very similar conclusions for Tripilia sites up to 35 hectares. And this is an important point, given recent claims for 100 hectare venture sites at Stubline, Belovode, Plochnik, though Drenovac now, um, Slavisa Peric suggests is rather smaller. This is the Drenovac plot. Okay, so those are ideas uh, that probably survive from the book. Now to the last rites. Now, how come the synthesis has survived when many individual parts are clearly wrong, been transcended? Or more importantly, why has no new synthesis been written? Well, this could be related to general factors, general factors like socio-political change in the West, the decline of worldviews, the decline of a confidence 
with the loss of empire in archaeology. Graham Clark's Cambridge World Order, when he sent Cambridge graduates out to colonize um, Australia and the world with Cambridge students, that's all gone now. Um, Ruth Tringham has suggested that there is this general political shift away from synthesis that results from this loss of um, confidence. So perhaps that's why syntheses are out of fashion. This is really a question for discussion for us now. Uh, another very clear point is that with the shift to post recessional archaeology, the focus was on small is beautiful. Um, they've rarely looked at large scale questions. Uh, that's not um, entirely true. Certainly not a being hotter recently. In terms of local factors, is it now that there's simply too much material? When I looked at Vinci sites in museums in Serbia, I might look at 20 or 30 or 40 boxes. Now I would have to look at thousands of boxes, and it's very hard to publish these. Synthesis now would involve looking at the publications or going to the museums to look at thousands of boxes. It certainly is a problem. Is there a sense also of a manana culture? Perhaps that it'll soon be the right moment to write a bunch of synthesis. I don't know. These are points that I'm very happy to discuss, and I hope we shall. So in conclusion, then, I still firmly believe the first point, it's the juxtaposition of highly differentiated artifact assemblages with these large villages in one of the most widespread cultures that distinguishes Vinci from any other in the Balkan Neolithic. I also am absolutely sure there's huge scope for further contextual analysis now that people are digging and recording contextually. It is my hope that every new excavation project needs to build in the cost of at least 30 AMS dates into their budget, because that's what you need to date a site. But my real hope is that there will be somebody else, perhaps one of the people in this seminar, who will be a new single author, who will write a new single author synthesis that really replaces the 1981 book. And these are my acknowledgements. John Landris, the Institute staff, who didn't care about theory. Peter Grimes, who supported me financially, or got financial support from the University of London. Milutin for being a great supervisor. My parents for love and support. Maya's father, the late Petar Martinovich. And Subsky Academia Nauka for legal support when I had problems and advice for getting out of them. Bori Ivanovich for his kind invitation to a trip to Rudniklava. And the countless members of museums in Balkan Carpathian countries who supplied me with material, litres of coffee. And now, more, most recently, Bisek Gaidaska for critical support and new ideas. Well, would you, in your short, brief uh, overview of the content of the book and the uh, major interpretations, uh, would you add maybe another set of topics today which were completely missing from the 1981 publication, which were not discussed at all in the 70s and 80s? I think all of all of those, uh, all of the topics that arise out of contextual digging uh, and recording. I think are, are, are really important. And so studies of household assemblages are very important. We can go much further than we could. And all, all the intrasite spatial analysis, which is, is possible now. And also because of the, the amazing possibilities of geophysics, the landscape geophysics, the idea that you can actually work out settlement plans these days, that's fantastically important. But I think the other big area is the area which evolves, at any rate, partly, maybe largely through post-processual studies, and that's the symbolic order, the much deeper insights into ideology, ritual, social control, social power, which I hardly talked about at all in the book. It's these sort of areas. The, the last point about household assemblages, though, 
is something that I'd like to return to very briefly, although you will probably criticize me very much for it, and that's the idea of deliberate house burning. Um, and in our uh, Tripilia project in Ukraine, we've come up with um, much, uh, largely through experimental work, we've come up with lots more empirical evidence in favor of deliberate house burning. So I would take that much, much more seriously uh, than I did in the book. But that's part of the story of intrasite analysis that's that's so so much more possible now. Those I think those are the main points. First of all, thanks again for having this wonderful piece of uh, history of the Balkan archaeology. I've uh, thanks to my previous companionship with uh, John, I've known some of this. I've heard some of these stories, but again hearing them again structured in another way. It's always very interesting and, and exciting to see how people from the outside come to the Balkans to do our archaeology. But I have two questions, if I may. Uh, the first one is, why do you think that a single author monography would be the best uh, way to proceed? Since all the things that you're mentioning now as possible paths for the future involve quite a lot of varied researchers. Why would you like to see a single author monography on Vinci now? Wouldn't it be, I'm just uh, playing devil's advocate now, wouldn't it be better to have a kind of co-author thing, a huger thing which would cover more issues and be more synthetic in that way? And yes, the, second question is, uh, the second question while I'm here and then I'll shut up, uh, is the one that probably Alexander Paravestre will pose. Have you had any uh, use of Vasic's documentation, first of all, and interpretation of Vincha. How did you cope with the, that fatal Vincha chronology mistake of Vasic? Well, the first one, I mean, I, I happen to know that a group of, of Serbian uh, and international scholars have been working on a multi-authored volume on the Vincha culture for five years, and I was supposed to be writing a preface to it four years ago, and it still hasn't come. So there's one, there's the practical issue of actually um, corralling all of the sheep in the same place and getting them to stay uh, peaceful and finish the writing. But there's also the point that people um, are all individuals, especially in Balkan archaeology, and it's very difficult to get a consistent view of something when you have five or even more, 20 authors. So it's partly also then a vision question. And I'll give you an example of that. That's Cyprian Broodbank's story of the musical book, The Middle Sea. The Middle Sea couldn't have been written by a panel of archaeologists. It had a single vision which radiated into every corner of the Middle Sea, the Mediterranean. And that's why I like single author synthesis, because of this vision. My answer to the second question is very simple. Because one of the, I perceived one of the main problems in writing about Vincia was that it was a, a, view, a view of a culture centered on the Vincia tell. I decided not to spend very much time on the Vincia tell, and I certainly didn't look at any of the original Vasic documentation at all. I simply wrote about what was published, and I wrote about all the other sites that, that in a sense, had been relatively or totally neglected a general story about Vincia. And so when it comes to a wonderful work on the um, fine-grained ceramic chronology from the Vincia tell from Wolfram Scheer, the chronology is fantastic that he derives for the Vincia tell, but sorry Wolfram, it doesn't solve the chronology of the Vincia culture. And, and that's for a very simple reason, that's that you cannot assume that a pot, a particular style and shape of pot, made at Vincia between 8.2 and 7.8 meters cote is dated to the same period as the same pot at Drenovac or even more at Tartaria. You cannot assume it and in fact the total radiocarbon dates demonstrate that this is wrong. So a chronology for, for the Vincia tell such as Wolfram's chronology works wonderfully for the Vincia tell but it tells you relatively little about any other major region. Okay, I lied. I have a third question. You provoked me right now. I remember our conversations at the beginning of the year 2000, 2001 in Durham. 
uh, when you taught me to think very critically about the concept of cultural group. And now, uh, throughout your talk, you are referring to the Vincha culture as opposed to the Vincha tell. So I'm just poking you. How about yeah. the concept of Vincha culture? What do we do with it right now? Archaeological culture in general and in, uh, apply to this very issue we are now discussing. Well, um, you'll note if you if if you look at a recording of this PowerPoint and you I'll send it to you if you if if this isn't distributed. Well, you won't find me talk about the Vincha culture. There. I talk about the Vincha group. And really, if I if if I'd been less lazy, I would have talked about the Vincha network because that's how I see these things. You know, these are these are networks of connections between humans and material and places that define what's going on. And the interesting thing about the Vincha group is that it's extremely widespread. It is vast. It covers something like 230,000 uh, 230, square kilometers. It's the uh, second largest group to Kukateni, Tripilia, which covers 250,000 square kilometers. And, and there is a very important question then, which relates very much to what you're talking about, is how this group kept together, how relatively similar material culture with, with, a, with a certain amount of regional difference was maintained of, over such a huge area. And I didn't have time to introduce today a different idea, which I call the the, the Vincha Big Other. Um, and if, if there's anyone apart from Predrag uh, coming from Ljubljana, I don't know if Bojidar Slapshak is with us today, but he will certainly know um, and love Savoy Zizek, whose ideas about the Big Other were taken, of course, from Lacan, but nevertheless, he developed them even further into a very useful concept which helps us to understand why culture, cultural groups like Vincha hang together. Um, and in this paper that Predrag kindly mentioned at the beginning, which is actually now in press, and I'll send him so you can all have the link to this if you want to read, if you are um, such nerds, you want to read a paper um, explaining what I've been talking about as well, then I spend some time talking about the Vincha Big Other as a network, but not a culture. I like that Thank much you. better. Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, and Zizek is quite well known beyond Ljubljana, don't worry. We read him in Belgrade too. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently he's even been to London. Well, uh, hello, John. Uh, thank you for this very interesting lecture and um, I'm eager to read your paper on uh, this uh, subject. Uh, uh, you already did answer one, uh, my first question, and that was, uh, uh, is uh, Winchatel a uh, center of uh, Wincha group? Because it is regarded uh, in uh, Serbian archaeology even today as such, only, in my opinion, only because it is very large and important site with uh, this uh, huge stratigraphy, but uh, it's near yeah. Belgrade and excavated from beginning of 20th century, uh, 1908. So it is, uh, in my opinion, it it's not uh, compulsory that it is a center of uh, Vincha group or culture of net or network as you said so you already answered that question could please i do. add one more one more one or, one or two yes, more yes, thoughts please do i mean what is central to a group that covers 180,000 square kilometers i mean d d did someone living in osentivan 8 or pavlovats know about the vincha tell perhaps some people had visited it but relatively few, I suspect. And there's a, a, a spatial cline here. People living at Banyitsa certainly would have known about the Vincha Tell. But in terms of centrality, I think we rely too much on this kind of idea of capital cities. Just because Vincha is a large site, and uh, absolutely, incredibly important, doesn't mean it was the centre in the same way that Belgrade is a centre as a capital. My my point exactly. You answered it and emphasized it now even further. That uh, 
leads us to my second uh, comment, uh, if not a question, and it is regarded today as a center and uh, as a center of a certain uh, entity. And uh, when you are talking about new synthesis uh, about Vincha, I, I have some fears because uh, ideas about Vincha group or uh, network or culture uh, or whatever are moving or drifting into at least in Serbian archaeology uh, and on fringes of Serbian archaeology uh, in uh, undesirable space and uh, 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 some undesirable questions, at least in my opinion, that is that Vinci is a civilization because it has uh, urban centers, uh, that Vinci is a part of uh, first European uh, civilization you have that uh, uh, in other countries as well you mentioned kukuteni and uh, <laughs> east yes you know uh, all about it then that is it it was a uh, eden of uh, peace and uh, e equality and so on and so on that uh, uh, however we may, may say that it is a, a pseudo scientific uh, uh, nonsense. It is a discourse that is uh, in uh, Serbian uh, mainstream uh, and in uh, media dominant, unfortunately. So, even in archaeological discourse, uh, I'm afraid that we might expect a synthesis in that direction and not, not in uh, the other one which uh, shows us the differences and some smaller, uh, rather important questions about regional uh, differences and so on. Because these are main issues, unfortunately, that are now dominant in public discourse in Serbia at the moment when Vinca is uh, uh, mentioned. Very curiously, it's always Lepinski Vir and Vinca. Starcevo is for some yes. reason totally abandoned, it, it's not attractive enough, it's not uh, mm -hmm. desirable ancestors, but the Lepinski Viri in which uh, there are our ancestors, and we had even in Belgrade large uh, panels on, on university. Winch uh, inhabitants are, are Belgrade citizens used to be and are mm -hmm. even today. So uh, this is my, these are my fears. Uh, based mm -hmm. mainly on uh, analysis of uh, pseudo-archaeological writing. And I, I, I'm not uh, uh, going to uh, add anything about Vasic because my uh, analysis of Vasic work, uh, as a matter of fact, has nothing to do with Vincha or Neolithic. It, or, only about his uh, met methodology. Thank you. Well, I mean, your, your comments about and alternative discourse is, uh, is well taken. And every, every nation is seeking to underline the period when uh, the period of the greatest cultural fluorescence uh, in their prehistory. And every nation picks particular groups to do this. In Hungary, it's the late Neolithic Tell groups of Eastern Hungary and the Bronze Age Tells. Uh, um, in Ukraine and Romania, it's Kukteni Tripilia. And there's no doubt that the development of huge, expensive traveling international exhibitions is part of the method of diffusing this message about the glories of our past. And it's, it's very common. And I think it's a way, uh, uh, it provides an opportunity for scholars to capitalize and put their message out um, to to the media whether the media want to listen to them or not is another question and I do remember uh, I was in Belgrade at the time when I think the first newspaper art article claiming that the inhabitants of Lepensky Vir were the first Serbs I remember that very well and there was clearly then um, an essential argument to be had here in this discourse. So it's it's really a question of 
to what extent you want to enter into these alternative discourses and you think you have a chance of making some progress in pushing a scholarly message across. It's clear that pseudoscientists, pseudo-archaeologists will never write a synthesis of the, the Vinci group. By definition, they don't know enough. It, they may well write a book about the first civilization in Europe based on Vinci Bello Burdum, but they're not going to be able to tell us very much that we didn't know. Um, so I don't think you need to be worried about them writing a genuine synthesis. But the problem is, to what extent you want to get, you commit yourself and your time, and sometimes even your personal safety, to engaging in these dialogues. I once wrote a, a preface to Mikhailo Videko's popular book about Ukrainian archaeology from from Trupilia to the Rus. And I was extremely rude about pseudoscientists who wrote bullshit about Ukrainian prehistory. And I said, I asked Videko, you know, do, do you think they'll try to assassinate me for these views? And he said, no, you're not important enough. Write whatever you want. So I did. But the question did occur to me. So there is a danger in when the nationalists get really involved in these alternative discourses. Uh, what was the perception of your 1981 book uh, among Serbian major principal archaeologists of the time? Because maybe a few years earlier, Milutin Garashanin wrote sort of a synthesis in Prahistoria Yugoslovenski Zemalia. But yeah. since you've been in tight contact with him, what was perception uh, or criticism of directed towards your, your book, your work? Well, let's start with Milutin Garashanin and then pass to general matters. Uh, Milutin and I agreed on many aspects of Vincia, but we couldn't agree on his Balkan Anatolian diffusionist complex. I agreed with the way that uh, dark burnished ware spread around the Balkans, but not with the Anatolian link. And he was at least disappointed with me and maybe angry with me that I didn't follow the professorial view on this matter. After all, what are PhD students for? But to support the professorial view. And he didn't approve of my disagreement there. And he always, if he mentioned my venture work at all, uh, it was with the criticism of his diffusionist ideas. More generally, and you might think this is a sramota, Belgrade was the only capital of the Balkans in Eastern Europe and Central Europe in which a review of the 1981 book did not appear. Next question. Silence. Uh, the fact that uh, it, your book was omitted from the reviewing processes in the Belgrade um, 1981 archaeological circles might have a lot to do with that mythologized uh, position of Vincha and particularly Vasic in, in the, that particular surrounding. So uh, an outsider telling us what our beautiful site is doing, of course, is not the thing that we shall boast about. So that that's probably... Uh, the consequence of the fact that Vincha has a very special place in, in the Serbian archaeological imagination, especially accompanied by its huge, uh, by the shadow of Vasic, by the shadow of the forefather of Serbian archaeology. And uh, that's why I was referring to that chronological mistake of Vasic, because, and Sasha has, uh, Alexander Palavestra has just finished a monumental book on that problem, uh, how, in fact, that particular episode somehow petrified the state in the Serbian archaeology for a very long time. And this episode of your, the, the destiny of your book, in fact, is one yet, one, yet another proof of that petrification, uh, which mm. is a long shadow of Vasic. Vis-a-vis -vis, um, Vasic and his excavations at Vincha, and Sasha might, would be interested in this because it's one of the things about Total. Um, the um, the Alistair Whittle project uh, with and the AMS dates at the Vinci Tell was how to produce 
a series of dates through the whole stratigraphic sequence because as you know contextual recording uh, was not really practiced then and so i i told my wife biseka who who was working as a postdoc on the whittle project that the most useful way of getting dates through the whole sequence of the tell was to find the bone tools which all had their cotta depth written on them in red ink and that would give them a complete sequence and i explained to her and she explained to alice the whittle that there were of course problems with the cotta with the depth from which the tools had been recorded but they had to accept the numbers written on the bone tools right now when you come to look up the total publication which gives the complete sequence of dates through through the tell based on the bone tools to my total amazement it was in complete stratigraphic agreement every single bone tool followed in stratigraphic agreement with the vasic cotta depths amazing how did it happen and i think it's a very important question i'm sorry if sasha's book has already gone to press <coughs> but it that instance d- did seem to save something from the vasic excavations oh yes uh, i uh, i don't dispute uh, definitely vasic uh, relative uh, stratigraphy of course uh, his absolute quotas uh, vary from uh, in one season uh, up to 70 centimeters and in uh, last uh, two seasons uh, it was a meter and a half or, or so and those are the most problematic ones but in uh, relative uh, stratigraphy i i understand that uh, it all fits in so it's not a problem no but these 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 red cotted depths were absolute depths That's what I'm saying. It's not relative, it's absolute. In regards to what? That's the main main question in his uh, uh, methodology and we don't know absolute to what in regards to what uh, uh, zero or absolute mm-hmm. point. Uh, it, it is a uh, relative uh, in a relative uh, stratigraphy uh, okay but uh, we we cannot say in one season it would vary you have that in his diary about cent, uh, 70 cm because one day it's uh, 2.50 and another day it's 2.8 uh, same spot so it is yeah. and then uh, in the last two season uh, he he had some problems with conceiving stratigraphy Uh, as a uh, problem he's uh, tried uh, it, it's a rather complicated question so he uh, artificially tried to uh, make uh, artificial strati- uh, stratigraphy uh, that would point but uh, as i said uh, i don't doubt that it, in relative order they fit I'm going back to the perception of this book and to the interesting phenomena that uh, the review of your uh, book uh, wasn't published or wasn't uh, written in Belgrade. Uh, one of the reasons I believe is was because it spoke with completely different language. All these settlement patterns, settlement structures, uh, network uh, ideas and graphs were something that until that period never appeared in uh, publications uh, which were which used to be read by the Yugoslav or Serbian or Slovene archaeologists. I remember from similar cases in Slovenia where first such uh, book with uh, or work with with settlement patterns and all these ideas appeared in 83 and it wasn't understood probably 10 15 years and simply omitted because no one wanted to do a review of something uh, that was for him or her something that uh, they did not understand well and uh, actually i needed maybe 10 years of 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 reading uh, to go back to that work of Bodida Slapšak in 83 which introduced uh, spatial analysis in Slovene archaeology for the first time to finally understand the whole idea and the background of this and i believe this was also the case with great deal of uh, of of your uh, book which was it spoke with different language different different uh, words were used different uh, concepts and ideas which were simply not familiar 
Yeah. And it took again in Serbia probably 10, 15 years with new generation of archaeologists that they simply embrace this, they've learned this more spontaneously. It wasn't, it didn't came as a shock to some someone who, uh, who used to read specific kind of uh, literature and follows this specific kind of discourse for 20 or 30 years. I think that's a very interesting comment. My reply to it would be, um, that do you think therefore that Nandi Kalic or Georgi Georgiev in Sofia understood what I was talking about when the Belgrade archaeologists didn't? You didn't interfere into their most favorite and most cherished archaeological myth. I you did that to the Serbian cool. archaeologists, not to the Bulgarian ones. So that's why they were more kind of inclined to see what the hell's going on, what, what news is going on. But uh, it's a completely different set of circumstances in Belgrade doesn't mean that they uh, necessarily understood it better in Bulgaria. They simply were not shying away from discussing it because that's not the venerable place of their whole uh, pantheon, if you wish, disciplinary pantheon. I think that's quite right, actually. I, um, I know the, the Hungarian and Bulgarian and Romanian reviews uh, didn't, didn't didn't really get, get the point. In fact, the first archaeologist from the area who got the point of it was Janos Mokai and it was a great pity that the book that he wrote about the development of the Neolithic in Hungary in 1983 was never translated into um, a comprehensible language but it formed the basis for uh, Mokai's book formed the basis for um, the development of processual archaeology in the in the late 1980s in Hungary, and that that was very interesting. If I may continue, after Vincha, now we are abandoning a bit of uh, uh, Vincha, you continue to work in Yugoslavia, you move to another project. The project I have in mind is Neothermal Dalmatia. You completely changed the landscape setting, you went to the sea, you went to the karstic landscape, something that was completely different from the landscapes you used to meet when you when you studied Vincha and other places in, in, in Balkans, not just Vincha and in Pannonian part. But uh, it's also visible how you change your perspective, not just geographical setting. The questions you pose there, of course, the aims of the projects were different. In your Thermal Dalmatia, it's visible that you moved more towards landscape perspective, you don't speak of groups anymore. You speak of um, long-term transformations of the landscape. Still quite processual topics, but with a lot of elements of something new. You introduced uh, in your work something new. How, how this was then? You, you probably you have met with different challenges there and you made some changes to your perspective. Well, the, the transition between the Vincha project and the Thermal Dalmatia was very much through the Celebats project with Dusan Kostic and Ruthie Tringham. Uh, and in 1977, I went along on the Celebats project, and the idea was to do intensive systematic field walking of the landscape around Celebats. But it wasn't possible. Um, we could visit known sites, but we couldn't do field walking at the time. And so it would have been wonderful. Uh, to have followed up the Vincha book with a regional project somewhere in the Vincha area and do intensive systematic field walking in a, in a bigger area as we could. Uh, really, that would have been for the first time, um, but it wasn't possible. So I looked around in the rest of uh, former Yugoslavia for uh, an area where it was possible, uh, and indeed that was. That was why I moved to the Dalmatia. And in two years before I started there, I made a, a long solo car and tent trip down the Adriatic from Rijeka to the Albanian border to, to find a study region for such a survey. And the only area which had a large amount of flat land, which was not totally dominated by erosion and erosion products was the plain of Zadar, Ravni Kotari. And that's why I ended up in Zadar. And it became clear that if you're doing intensive systematic field walking, you need to collect everything you find. And so 
after the first season in 1982, um, we collected material which was certainly Paleolithic, um, going on into post-medieval, the famous Ishka pottery, Ishka Keramika, made on the island of Veli Ish. And so this is what made me look, first of all, at the temporal dimensions of the landscape. There was no alternative but to look at long-term um, landscape change. And that constrains you on what you do with the cultural material. But in any case, um, my partner in Zadar, Professor Shime Batovich, had already written extensively about most of the material culture in that area. Or if he hadn't, there were other specialists who had. And so there were particular ideas about the, the groups, the cultural group, the phases, the ages. And it was those, those relations which interested me. And so there were three idefix, if you like, which we started off to investigate. One was that the Neolithic sites were found in nice flat areas with good soil. The second was that there were no Bronze Age sites because they were all pastoralists and mobile pastoralists at that. And the third idefix was that Iron Age people lived in hill forts. Well, it wasn't very difficult to see that if you did a, an intensive systematic field walking project, across all the total range of landscape um, segments in the Ravni Kotari, you could examine these idefix very carefully. Uh, and we did. We found that in most cases, two of the idefix were right. There were relatively few Iron Age sites around, scattered across the landscape. Most of the population was indeed concentrated in the hill forts. But our soil scientists worked out, very, uh, Rob Scheel worked out a very Better methodology by which he could explain the presence of people in hill forts um, in terms of climate and local land use potential. It was really only in the Bronze Age when we found dramatic evidence for settlements and the use of dry stone wall constructions, which completely opened up a new dimension of Bronze Age archaeology in Dalmatia. Um, and so, so that. When you're faced with a long-term landscape dilemma, I think you have to take the landscape and not so much cultural detail into, into your, your attention and your focus. And, and that's what I think I did, Bob Shield especially, and I did. There was also the point that, as with many of the sites, um, the pollen diagrams from Serbia, although many, and I spent a lot of time looking at them, were undated. There were no radiocarbon dates. So you came to Serbia, deconstruct Wincha, you came to Dalmatia, deconstruct, to deconstruct uh, some of the idefix and uh, construct uh, dry stone landscape in the Ravni yeah. Well, these years must have left some traces uh, in your perception of archaeology and biological potential of, let's say, former Yugoslavia and variety that uh, you probably, you were not aware at the beginning. Oh, absolutely, yes. The, the idea that you could actually study dry stone wall monuments uh, in the coastal area was something that I had, of course, never even contemplated when I was up in the Lurs Plains of the Vojvodina. And indeed, the, and indeed the, the aspects of research that I enjoyed the most um, in in the, the whole Dalmatia project was actually the experimental work on the on dry stone wall architecture. I worked with a, some some broad minded people in an amazing, um, almost unknown uh, sort of friends group called the Dry Stone Walling Association, which is based in or was based in Birmingham at the time. And these are people who go out in their weekends and repair walls with dry stone wall techniques. And I discussed how you could build hill forts like Nadin or enclosures like Chauschewitze with dry stone walling. And they gave me some very good ideas about how to go about it. And so that chapter in Near Thermal Dalmatia about dry stone wall construction is my favorite chapter in the whole book. So, yeah, it's variety. You're quite right. There's a, it's immense variety. And I suppose if I'd, the, the other area which would have provided another 
uh, view on on that diversity would have been um, the high generic area, and I regret that I never had the opportunity to, to work there. Mm. That would be very interesting too. It looks that we have exhausted questions and comments, and yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, well, also we have really immensely enjoyed your company and your ideas on behalf of our colleagues from the project harry stem and all of the public that joined us today i would like to thank you for being with us and i hope we'll soon read not just those two books that you are planning to publish this year but some more books as well thank you very much it probably i i hope i hope you'll enjoy the music more than the book mm -hmm.